amongst the number of uh, former CEO people, and then the CEO people that had a superb education, education and muscle set, I mean, uh, muscle set. <laughs> and uh, uh, here is uh, uh, assistant professor of the full time, uh, and then went back to his PhD institute as, uh, as faculty, and uh, signposts of uh, planets and uh, other information around the Andromeda uh, stars. Uh, and, you know, like a couple of years ago, if somebody would tell me that I'm going to be working on the works, I would uh, say that this person is crazy. But, you know, I, uh, it turned out that these objects are actually uh, extremely interesting. And, you know, this is basically what I'm going to pursue uh, during my talk. So first of all, let me tell you about a little bit about uh, metal uh, rich white dwarfs. Uh, you know what I mean by uh, this church. So there is some uh, a little bit of history to this uh, subject, and if uh, Martin were here, he uh, might actually correct some of my uh, statements uh, that I make uh, in the slides. But anyway, uh, so the first uh, metal-rich white dwarf was discovered in 1919 uh, uh, by Dutch astronomer Van Maren, uh, who has <coughs> uh, basically found one hyperpromotion star, which means that the star is close, you know, it has a low luminosity. Uh, and this star has a very pro had a very prominent calcium and iron absorption uh, features in its spectrum. So initially, he classified the star as uh, being an F-type star. Uh, but later on, in the 60s, uh, Weidemann has shown that this star actually is a white dwarf uh, with a metal abundance which is 30,000 times uh, lower uh, below uh, solar uh, abundance. Uh, however, given that the, the atmospheres of white dwarfs are extremely transparent, they are thin transparent, uh, you can actually detect metals in uh, very low uh, amounts, uh, which uh, we can, uh, you know, and we can actually do this in white dwarfs. So metal-rich white dwarfs are usually denoted uh, when, when you find the uh, initial are pretty much lost in this field because of the notation, because they really know like dA, dZ, dB, dBz, and so on. So basically, whenever white dwarf is metal-rich, you have this letter Z. Uh, we have this letter Z at the end of the notation, and DA usually means uh, you know hydrogen white dwarf, DB means uh, helium white dwarf. So this is the all of all of it, uh, this uh, story, this classification. But you're saying, you're saying, you're saying it is thirty thousand point below solar. Yeah, below. You call that metal rich. Why do you call that metal rich? That's you'll uh, see. Uh, so so the A and the B is like in supernova hydrogen versus. No no no. Here it's it's uh, the spectrum looks like a spectrum of an A star, and this spectrum looks like a spectrum of a B star. So that's why this is dwarf A for B, basically. There is a, there is some set of uh, mnemonic rules, and once you memorize them, you're you know you're going to be an expert in this. Basically. <laughs> so right now we know that uh, like tens of percent of white dwarfs are uh, metal rich, and uh, for white dwarfs with temperatures uh, less than 10,000 Kelvin, uh, the fraction of uh, DACs, for example, the hydrogen rich uh, white dwarfs which are enriched in metals, is uh, at a level of you know 25 percent. Uh, for hotter white dwarfs, this fraction is actually somewhat lower, 5%, this is maybe just a selection effect, because uh, the thickness of the atmosphere uh, and various other properties uh, do depend on the temperature of the white dwarf by its So this, work, this uh, is an example of uh, metal-rich white dwarf. This is actually the most metal-rich white dwarf uh, ever detected. Uh, this is its uh, telephone number. It was detected uh, in a sort of digital, digital sky survey. Uh, this is a DB white dwarf. You see prominent uh, helium lines, but also you see a whole bunch of magnesium lines, uh, silicon lines, uh, calcium lines, uh, and so on. So these are you know, different parts of the spectrum. This is the red part of the spectrum. So you see sodium line, oxygen lines, and so on. And if you summarize the property of this uh, object, uh, they can be you know, put up in this uh, uh, table. So this uh, metal-rich uh, uh, white dwarf at a temperature of 38.6 thousand uh, Kelvin. Uh, has, you know, of course, uh, very high gravity, as all of these uh, of, of white, dwarf, white dwarfs uh, have. You know, it's pretty massive white dwarf. It has a mass of about 0.9 uh, solar masses. Uh, you know, of course, a small radius, less than 1% of the uh, solar radius. And its cooling age, you know, that is the age you know, that it was cooling since uh, throwing off uh, its uh, outer hydrogen layers, 
it's about 600, uh, 600 million years. So this, oh, that, then there is a, you know, uh, then, you know, from these uh, lines, you can actually measure the amounts uh, of different elements relative to helium in the atmosphere of the white dwarf. And what you find is that uh, the amount of hydrogen in the atmosphere of this white dwarf is extremely low. It's like, uh, you know, 10, it's like a million times lower than the amount of uh, helium. At the same time, things like, uh, uh, things like silicon, magnesium, oxygen are overabundant even compared to, even compared to hydrogen. Okay, so there is more uh, of, of oxygen, magnesium, and silicon than hydrogen in the atmosphere of this uh, particular uh, object. And this is quite interesting because in astrophysics we are used to the ubiquity of hydrogen and you know, everywhere hydrogen dominates over any other element. So in this uh, atmosphere, so this white work, this is uh, not uh, the case and this is a very important observation for what I'm going to be telling you uh, later on. Uh, okay, so... Um, so why why is it uh, uh, so as uh, really uh, has pointed out why uh, you know having an object which has uh, a metal abundance uh, which is thirty thousand times lower than solar is uh, you know an interesting thing why do I call this object metal rich well I call it metal rich because there should be zero elements uh, zero high metal uh, zero uh, high Z elements in the atmosphere of these white dwarfs and the reason is that uh, uh, white dwarfs have this uh, thin convective uh, envelope on their surfaces. Uh, but they also have very high, in, in, in which all these metals can be mixed in. But they also have very high gravity. And this high gravity causes constant continuous sedimentation of high Z elements with respect to hydrogen or helium uh, down into the uh, core of the white dwarf. And uh, these uh, plots show uh, the sort, sort of uh, sedimentation time scale for the uh, hydrogen rich white dwarfs and the uh, helium rich white dwarfs for different uh, white dwarf masses indicated by different curves as a function of uh, uh, effective temperature of the white dwarf. So what you see is that, for example, for this particular uh, object that I just uh, showed you before, you know, this is approximately one solar mass white dwarf, uh, with a temperature of 30,000 Kelvin, the sedimentation time scale is uh, somewhere around 10,000 10, years. And the age of the object is 600 million years. So over the course of its evolution, all these uh, heavy elements must have sunk down and. Uh, we would essentially see no lines of, you know, calcium or uh, silicon or magnesium or anything else in the atmosphere of this object. But we do see that. And uh, so that is presenting a huge puzzle. So when people realized that, they started, of course, uh, looking for the ways of, you know, how, how is it possible? How can you get uh, uh, metals in atmospheres of uh, these uh, white dwarfs? For hot white dwarfs, you can appeal to the uh, radiative levitation because, you know, there is a, there's going to be a radiation force uh, you know, the, these objects have high luminosities uh, and they may kind of cause uh, high Z elements to levitate in atmospheres of white dwarfs. But for objects with temperatures below 20,000 Kelvin, this is not going to work. I mean, in this case, uh, radiation levitation doesn't play any role. And you can also notice that uh, in hydrogen white dwarfs, uh, the sedimentation time scale can get really, really short. So, at the, for, uh, you know, essentially almost independent of the mass of the white dwarf, at 15,000 Kelvin, uh, hydrogen rich uh, white dwarf has a sedimentation time scale uh, at the level of several days. So if you drop you know, a piece of iron into the atmosphere of this white dwarf, within several days you won't uh, see any iron in the atmosphere at all. So that is a big puzzle. And it's going to explain why it, it's so different from hydrogen Me? Uh, okay. You know the answer, I'm sure. Well, actually, you didn't uh, question this calculation. They have uh, so many wiggles over here, but uh, of course, you know the difference in atomic uh, weights uh, plays uh, quite a big role, uh, and uh, you know, and there is a very strong dependence on the temperature. Uh, so the, actually, the, the width of this uh, convection zone uh, varies uh, quite a bit uh, uh, depending on the temperature of the white dwarf and depending on its uh, uh, mass. And different models actually predict quite a different extent of this uh, convection uh, zone. So I don't think uh, these calculations are even should be quoted within like, is like, you know, five or ten percent. So it's not just the difference in zero ray. It, it is, uh, well, it's either the same zero ray as the alpha elements. Right, right, right. And not much weight. Actually, actually you, can, actually, you can also show, I mean, uh, the detailed calculations show that uh, the sedimentation time scales for different elements are not so much different. So calcium or iron, uh, sediment on roughly, you know, the same uh, time scales uh, pretty much in the time. Um, so, given this Sedimentation time to determine the abundances into fluxes. So, what do the model fluxes? You'll, you'll, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. 
Okay, so uh, you know, given these short sedimentation time scales, essentially uh, the only way you can have a, a metals in the atmosphere of white dwarf is that if you somehow are constantly accreting these metals in the atmosphere, and then so you have to have you know continuous supply of metals uh, in the atmosphere. And uh, as soon as people realize that you need to somehow maintain the abundance of metals in the atmosphere, uh, they basically came up with the idea of the interstellar medium uh, accretion uh, hypothesis. So uh, in, this, uh, in this hypothesis, metals are replenished uh, by accretion from the interstellar medium uh, because, uh, after all, white dwarf is uh, going through the interstellar medium and it's going to accrete some amount of this uh, uh, material on the surface and that may contaminate the surface in, uh, in the high Z element. Uh, so you can calculate the accretion rate. It's going to be something like bond D little to type accretion. You know, this is MZ, the abundance of uh, high Z elements in, uh, well, uh, ISM, this is the velocity of white dwarf, this is a gravitational focusing uh, uh, kind of uh, factor. And so, uh, in the end, if you go uh, through this uh, sort of uh, calculation, you find that the uh, rate of accretion uh, becomes uh, on, at the level of 10 to the 6 grams uh, per second for typical ISM uh, densities, uh, you know, like one particle per uh, cubic centimeter. Uh, well, it turns out that this. Uh, that this uh, rate at which you accrete mass is not enough to explain uh, metal contamination in the atmospheres of uh, many of the white dwarfs. But even worse problem uh, lies in the fact that uh, in, in the fact that uh, relative elemental abundances in the case of accretion from the ISM should be compatible with what you observe in the interstellar medium, right? Uh, and uh, as I uh, just showed you, you know, for, uh, for uh, this uh, high, uh, for this helium rich uh, white dwarf in the very beginning of the, of the talk, uh, this is completely not the case. In human rich white dwarfs, they are finding that the amount of hydrogen in the atmosphere is completely negligible compared to the high Z elements. But if you are creating uh, hydrogen rich uh, uh, you know, gas uh, from the ISM, hydrogen is lighter than helium. So it's going to hang around in the atmosphere, and pretty soon the full atmosphere will be just coated with hydrogen. And this is not what you see. So that actually essentially pretty much rules out the uh, ISM accretion hypothesis simply because in this case, uh, you know, the only element that you would see in the uh, envelope uh, would be hydrogen. And instead, you see a lot of metals and uh, no hydrogen. And then there is, of course, a problem with the metal accretion rates because many of the observed by the dwarfs, uh, these metals, uh, must have much higher uh, metal accretion rates than 10 to the 6 uh, grams uh, per second. So essentially, this uh, theory uh, has uh, failed. And uh, you know, people have realized that back in the 80s, but that for a long time, there was no uh, competing theory. So interest in the field has kind of uh, gone down. You know, how do you explain this uh, metal rich white dwarf? So this is kind of off topic, but if, if you expect 10 to the 6 gram accretion per second, and you have a 10 to the 8 year old white dwarf, uh, why don't you see hydrogen in the atmosphere these white dwarfs? Yeah, I mean, this is a good question. I mean, uh, I, I, I don't know why. Maybe, maybe the reserve. Sure. Maybe there is some way of uh, excluding, uh, uh, you know, this uh, ISM accretion. Uh, but essentially, this, uh, you know, what you what you observe is you don't see any hydrogen in atmospheres of many white dwarfs. Yeah. So you have to just, find some way of actually excluding uh, uh, this. Uh, yeah. Because it should accretion. be then 10 to the 20, 10 to the 20 something grams. Which yeah, is yeah. A lot. Yeah. 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 I, I agree with you, but that's uh, okay. that's not mm -hmm. that's Fair not enough. what you see. Well, we thought about the magnetic field required to prevent accretion. Well, I mean, even this magnetic field, you will still get uh, some accretion. And many of these white dwarfs, you, you have uh, limits on their uh, magnetic field, so they are not so magnetic. So in that case, you know, it's hard to appeal to magnetic field. <coughs> okay, so uh, if this material that has to be accreted uh, onto the surface of the white dwarf is not interstellar, then uh, maybe it may have some circumstellar origin. That is, this is a material that uh, has always been present in the vicinity of white dwarf and then somehow uh, found its way uh, onto the surface of white dwarf. So this is a, a different hypothesis that uh, has gotten support uh, uh, you know, over the recent years predominantly. It was first proposed in 2003 by Mike uh, Jura, uh, but it rests on the idea and on the actual uh, observations of uh, debris disks uh, around the white dwarfs. And let me uh, now switch uh, to this topic and tell you about what these are. Okay, in 1987, Zuckerman and uh, Declan uh, have uh, used the infrared uh, telescope uh, facility uh, to observe uh, the white dwarf uh, uh, G4938. Uh, and what they found, this is a uh, you know, 
basically a pure from their nature paper, they found that this white dwarf uh, in a kind of early genes regime has some access uh, emission in the infrared uh, depth. And usually uh, this infrared emission, uh, in the case, for example, if you give this very young star, you know, this will be a early genes uh, tail, uh, and then there is, and then you see some infrared access, you know that this infrared access is going to be produced by a protoplanetary disk. Basically a structure that intercepts uh, part of the light produced by the star and re-radiates it in the infrared, in, in, in the infrared band. <coughs> Uh, so the same mechanism, uh, they concluded that you know this, uh, this can hardly be a white dwarf, and if this is a disk, then uh, this must be a material pretty close to the surface of the star, because the temperature corresponding to this uh, uh, to, to this uh, emission produced by uh, uh, this material was around 1,000 Kelvin. Given uh, the low temperatures of white dwarfs, this uh, uh, gas, uh, this material, this dust, has to sit uh, quite close uh, to the surface of the white dwarf. Now, uh, this picture, we have a very good confirmation of this uh, observational data. Uh, so, for example, this is the same uh, object, but now it's a full spectrum, uh, you know, this is a Spitzer photometry and spectroscopy using, uh, uh, using uh, you know, Spitzer IRS. Uh, what you see is, you know, an attempt to, to fit the spectrum of this object. This is a kind of white dwarf uh, black body spectrum with effective temperature of 11.5 uh, thousand Kelvin. And this is a black body uh, heat, assuming a ring, uh, a ring of dust that affects the temperature of a thousand uh, Kelvin. As you can see, this, uh, you know, uh, this uh, heat is uh, the dust that does uh, pretty well. It uh, does a uh, reasonable well. You just need to vary essentially the size of this ring to get enough uh, surface area to reproduce uh, you know, the amplitude of this curve. And then you notice also this uh, interesting structure, this bump uh, in a spectrum that can also uh, actually be uh, reproduced. So now we uh, know about uh, 20 uh, metal rich white dwarfs around which uh, we have been able to detect these uh, infrared uh, uh, accesses. Uh, this is uh, another uh, uh, similar white dwarf, GD362. Uh, Again, you see you know, a contribution from uh, blood body, uh, kind of hot, pretty hot to dust at a temperature of 900 Kelvin. Again, you see this uh, bump uh, at uh, around the 10 micro. This bump is also quite familiar to people who have uh, ever been, been modeling uh, emission from the protoplanetary disks uh, because this is simply a bump produced by micro-sized uh, silica uh, dust particles. So if you heat up uh, micro-sized silica dust particles, they will be uh, giving you access emission at this uh, particular uh, band. So that suggests that there is some amount of small dust mixed in in these uh, debris disks around the white dwarfs. But how much of this dust uh, do they have, it's, 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 it's not very clear. You also notice that the single temperature black body, you know, it does produce a reasonable fit at the near infrared wavelengths, but at far infrared wavelengths, it's, uh, it's failing. So there is more emission at far infrared wavelengths. And that suggests that uh, this is not just a, a you know, wriggle at a fixed unique temperature. And you actually need a collection of rings uh, to fit uh, this spectrum reliably. So it really is a disk, uh, you know, and uh, you have to produce a, a fit to this uh, spectrum by using a multi-color, multi-temperature, uh, multi-temperature black body fit. So uh, at long wavelengths, uh, if at even long, longer wavelengths, uh, the emission is not so prominent, and this suggests that the amount of cold material that would be producing emission at uh, larger uh, wavelengths is not very high. It is not very large. That is, uh, these the disks have uh, some outer radius. And there isn't much material beyond this uh, outer uh, outer radius. Finally, the, uh, from the detailed uh, fitting of the spectral shape of uh, you know such of such observations, uh, people have figured out that the spectrum is very similar to the spectrum of an optically thick, but geometrically very thin uh, 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 dust dust layer that is distributed in the vicinity of uh, of uh, this uh, white dwarf. So that essentially makes uh, makes uh, this structure, you know, ge optical thickness and geometric and geometric uh, thinness, uh, seems to suggest a similarity between uh, these debris disks and, for example, Saturn rings, which are also extremely thin uh, and optically uh, close to being optically thick. Uh, so this this plot shows uh, the distribution. Are really optically thick or really uh, They are vertical. I mean, because uh, in the spectral modeling, what you care about is a vertical or optical thickness. <coughs> so the spectrum is well reproduced by just adding temperature going as r to the minus uh, three quarters, uh, and uh, you know the disk being optical thick. Uh, so this is a plot that uh, shows the distribution of, of uh, uh, well, basically shows uh, the mass accretion rate of high z elements in grams per second. 
uh, well, as a function of pooling age, but it doesn't matter. So the horizontal axis doesn't matter. Just, just see, you know, that there is a pretty significant spread in the uh, metal accretion rates of uh, different objects, uh, and you know, metal accretion rates can go, uh, you know, as, can be as high as like 10 to the 11 grams per uh, uh, grams per second. So it can be very, very high. Uh, people have also uh, very early noticed uh, that uh, essentially all of the white dwarfs, these uh, debris disks around them, uh, occupy this upper part of the diagram. That, that is, debris disks are mainly present around uh, objects with, with significantly high uh, mass accretion rates, you know, higher than, for example, 3 times 10 to the 8 uh, grams uh, per second. And this uh, actually uh, has important implications for the story that I'm going to tell you uh, later on. Uh, of course, there's a number of objects that have, uh, you know, lower uh, mass accretion rates, uh, objects uh, that don't have, uh, you know, disks uh, around them. And it may be, may still be that they uh, also have disks around them, but these disks are optically thin, or these disks have been present in the near past, uh, but now are gone, and we are seeing, you know, this petering out, uh, uh, kind of, not accretion, but, you know, sedimentation of uh, elements uh, in the surfaces of these uh, white dwarfs. Uh, another interesting discovery was made uh, uh, essentially several years from now, uh, in 2006, by uh, Boris uh, Jansike. Uh, his group uh, have, uh, has been observing uh, uh, white dwarfs, uh, me measuring spectra of white dwarfs uh, in the optical. And normally, uh, you know, you, you expect uh, to see the absorption spectrum of uh, white dwarf and nothing else. However, they managed uh, to find an, some emission lines produced uh, in the spectrum. And these emission lines have a funny shape. So this is a you know, part of the spectrum uh, that they got. Uh, there are three uh, emission lines. This is a calcium uh, triplet uh, around 860 uh, uh, nanometers. Uh, what, they, what they see is that this, each of these lines has a characteristic double shape, du double uh, you know, peaked uh, profile. And those of you who uh, have ever modeled uh, uh, emission from uh, rotating structures like disks, uh, probably know that uh, disk-like uh, uh, gaseous structure uh, emitting, uh, you know, at some temperature would produce exactly this uh, uh, light shape. And then because you will see some blue shifted and some red shifted uh, uh, emission. How so about the asymmetry? Sorry? How about the asymmetry? Well, yeah, the asymmetry was uh, kind of uh, interesting. Uh, so first of all, uh, there is uh, this uh, quite significant asymmetry, which people uh, have ascribed to the fact that uh, there is this gaseous disk that produces uh, incapillary motion, but then this disk must be uh, accepted. So the best interpretation, and essentially the only interpretation uh, has ever, that has ever been proposed to this case, is that the, this, uh, the, what we see is an eccentric uh, disk around the white board. We also see that this disk must be persistent, because if you, uh, some observations were made uh, uh, at, at an interval of uh, several months, and people found that the uh, uh, early heights of these peaks uh, have uh, uh, changed and respect to each other which suggests that if this disk is accepted, then it must be changing its orientation with respect to us. Uh, but from the line shape, from the outer kind of widths of, the, uh, of each of the lines, you can measure you know, rotational velocity, this kind of projected rotational velocity that we see, it's 630 kilometers per second. And then knowing, uh, knowing the mass of the white dwarf, you can figure out what is the radius from which uh, this emission is coming, simply from the simple, uh, assume, by assuming that this is a declared uh, velocity. And so you find, that, of course, if you do this exercise, that this uh, uh, gas must be rotating pretty close to the surface of the white dwarf, within uh, roughly 10 to 50 uh, radii of the white dwarf. So remember, again, you know, all this, uh, this, uh, this scale, 10 uh, radii of for the white dwarf, is about 10% of the solar radius. So this is all within just one solar radius away from the surface of the white dwarf. So this material must be pretty compact. Uh, and then, well, after, so, so now, now people know uh, three or four uh, such white dwarf objects in which they detected uh, optical lines uh, in the mission, which indicate that these are uh, gaseous disks around white dwarfs. Uh, then they took uh, Spitzer and looked very deeply at these objects to try to see whether there is any dust emission in these systems. And uh, not surprisingly, they found that in all three cases, apart from the gaseous disk, they also see the dust disk uh, around uh, the same white dwarfs. Uh, so this, uh, for example, you know, one of the systems says it's 1228. This is an infrared spectrum uh, that uh, shows clear access at the long wavelengths because dotted line uh, is uh, the spectrum of uh, the white dwarf uh, in the early genes uh, regime. And so you clearly need some additional components which are shown here you know, as this dash line. And these are just different models. Blue and red are just uh, some different models trying to reduce this uh, access issue. 
And by doing this modeling, you can basically figure out what is the uh, uh, you know what 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 is the inner uh, what is the temperature, the inner radius of the dust disk that you have to take into account. What is the temperature of the outer disk, outer uh, edge of the disk, and so on and so forth. And so you, you can do this for each of uh, for each of this uh, for each of this uh, objects. Uh, once uh, people have done that, uh, they found that uh, you know, not only these objects uh, contain gas and dust and disks at the same time, but in space, gas and dust disks overlap with each other. So this diagram it may not be the best uh, presentation, but what this diagram shows is that the you know, thin uh, red uh, kind of bars are the extent, represent the extent of the uh, dust disk and blue, uh, blue you know, white uh, stripes uh, represent the extent of the gas disk. And in all three systems, there is a significant overlap between the locations of the gas disk and the dust disk. And the units here are you know, separations uh, in units of the uh, post uh, star radius, white or black radius. So, as you see, you know, in all cases, uh, these uh, disks extend only out to approximately you know, 100 uh, white or radii, which means that there is an outer cut of both to the gaseous and to the dust disks uh, uh, at approximately one uh, solar radius. So that's that is a good number to keep uh, to keep in mind. And is the inner edge real? Sorry? The inner edge of the gas disk is it real? Oh the gas disk, yeah, it is very real because you know from uh, you, you get it just from measuring the width of this. Not just, a, not just a change in the ionization state, so you just lose the well, that is actually uh, that is actually a good uh, question. I mean of course this is uh, you know the inner edge of uh, the you know, the material that's producing emission. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would say that uh, this is not the real edge in the case of this kind of gas should extend actually all the way to the uh, central object, but well, simply because it will have some viscosity in this kind of, so it's gonna, you know, tend to move toward the central star. And viscous time scales here are very low. But this is kind of theoretical interpretation, which uh, let me put it off uh, at the end of uh, Okay, good. So uh, the current statistics regarding these uh, compact uh, disks of dust and gas, uh, you know, in the uh, vicinity of the white dwarf, is the following: uh, tens of uh, white dwarfs are uh, enriched in metals, uh, and approximately 50% of uh, uh, single metal-rich white dwarfs, which have uh, mass accretion rates in excess of this number, uh, show uh, presence of the infrared axis in their spectra, which means uh, that these objects uh, have uh, dusty, uh, compact dusty disks uh, in their vicinity. Is, is the correlation between age and um, Not really. I don't have this plot. I think there was... Oh, no, no, wait a second. Uh, this is a plot, right? I, I, I don't really see. And it's spanning from 100 million years to like uh, 10 million years. But it's not very strong relation. Maybe there is some some of higher uh, low ranges. <coughs> okay, uh, and uh, so essentially, you know, uh, from from this statistics, you can estimate that you know several percent of single white dwarfs uh, should have this uh, uh, circumstellar dust around them. Uh, and this actually has uh, received a pretty good confirmation. Like uh, last week, there was a paper. Uh, based on uh, using uh, WISE uh, satellite, uh, basically, which is an uh, infrared survey uh, satellite, all sky uh, satellite, to cross correlate positions of the white dwarfs with fluxes uh, obtained from this uh, uh, satellite data. You can uh, find you know, whether there is any infrared accesses around uh, all of the white dwarfs that you have in your other catalogs. And uh, you know, what was found is that there is a large number of uh, candidates, like about 60 or maybe even 80. Uh, candidate white dwarf systems and each possess uh, these uh, uh, infrared uh, accesses. So now people just need to, you know, take spits or something else and follow up on these objects at much higher resolution and uh, much higher uh, sensitivities. And also there is an important piece of the story is that, you know, all three white dwarfs which have a compact uh, gaseous disks around them uh, also uh, have uh, compact uh, dust disks, which are especially coincident uh, uh, with this uh, gaseous disk. This is something that you know we basically I'm just uh, laying down the observational uh, evidence in favor of, of the existence of uh, these uh, objects. Okay, uh, apart from these compact debris disks, so there are other uh, kinds of debris disks which have recently been uh, detected around by Dwarfs and uh, Spitzer. These are uh, these are the debris disks uh, which are you know more uh, similar to the uh, debris disks which are which we 
are used to seeing, you know, in a solar system, like you know, hyper belt, for example, or asteroid belt, uh, or around the young stars. So these degrees are detected around very young uh, white dwarfs. Many of them still have plenty of nebulae around them, and the temperatures uh, which we are talking about now are not uh, on the order of 10,000 Kelvin, but actually on the order of 100,000 Kelvin. So they are, these are very, very hot white dwarfs. In this case, uh, to produce emission uh, at uh, the wavelengths of, you know, like uh, uh, 5 or 10 microns, this dust must be located very far uh, from the white dwarf surface, and which puts it at the distances of about several tenths of uh, astronomical units. So that's why I'm saying that this is uh, something more akin to the uh, normal kind of uh, degree disk around the uh, young star. And this is the kind of degree disk that, uh, you know, have also been uh, popping up uh, only quite uh, recently. Uh, but this is the type of degree disks which I'm not going to be talking about in my talk, okay? So I'm just going to be uh, uh, discussing, you know, the origin and the physics of these compact degree disks which I have uh, just described uh, previously. Okay, good. So uh, next thing I want to tell you is what are the current ideas about the origin of this refractory circumstellar material uh, close to the white dwarf. I mean, apparently, you know, if white dwarf has undergone the phase of the AGB evolution and has uh, thrown out its uh, envelope, or basically lost most of its uh, uh, mass uh, in, in going from the main sequence uh, to the white dwarf uh, stage, then no material could have uh, survived, uh, you know, within probably several astronomical units of the white dwarf. Not speaking uh, about uh, the immediate vicinity of the white dwarf, which is, you know, one uh, solar radius. So it must have gotten there somehow else. Uh, so in, you know, in, in 2003, Mike, uh, you had this idea that uh, uh, the origin of this uh, refractory material in the vicinity of the white dwarf may be due to the disruption of an asteroid. And uh, his logic was very simple. Uh, he just uh, kind of calculated the Roche radius of uh, uh, an asteroid that is a density of about one gram per uh, cubic centimeter. Uh, what would be the uh, radius at which this asteroid is getting disrupted by the tidal force uh, of the uh, white dwarf at a mass of about one uh, solar radius? And what you find if you do the calculation is that this Roche radius is about uh, uh, one uh, solar radius. That means that any object, that any you know, massive object held by solar gravity gets within one solar radius of uh, uh, the star, it basically gets destroyed by the tidal forces and then uh, it's uh, going to form some kind of disk uh, uh, with a radius <coughs> comparable, comparable to one solar radius. So that idea is kind of naturally and quite nicely explains the outer, uh, outer extent of uh, uh, this uh, compact uh, radius. And then because of the mutual collisions between these uh, uh, you know, disrupted uh, particles, you're going to grind down these particles you know, smaller and smaller rubble, and finally it will collisionally settle into the, you know, this uh, very geometrically thin and optically thick configuration, which is pretty much akin to the uh, seven degrees. Uh, so what you, what you can do, for example, to support this hypothesis, you can uh, calculate the total amount of uh, high-Z material that you see in the atmospheres of white dwarfs. So knowing the temperature of white dwarf and knowing its mass, you can calculate for a particular cooling age uh, what is the mass of the uh, convective envelope, and then from the line strength of these metals, you can kind of figure out how much mass and high Z elements have to be sitting in this uh, convective envelope. And what you find is that this mass in just calcium alone, you know, it's shown over here, you know, uh, this is the maximum number that you can get by uh, ISM attrition if you stretch all the assumptions you know, to the very limit. And of course, you cannot explain all these objects by uh, interstellar uh, meteor attrition, even if you forget about these complications with you know, hydrogen. Uh, and you know, the masses of uh, uh, high-Z elements in some of these white dwarfs are pretty significant. They are comparable in some cases to you know, 200 or you know, 500 uh, uh, kilometer-sized uh, asteroids, which is you know, quite a quite a significant amount of mass that has to be delivered uh, into the white dwarf on a you know, reasonably short uh, time scale. So uh, this idea that uh, these disks might be produced by the disruption of you know, 10 to 100 kilometer uh, uh, asteroid uh, doesn't uh, actually sound uh, also crazy based on this argument uh, related to the mass of the high elements. Now, then you can look at the compositional variations, you know, because you in many white dwarfs, you can measure different uh, elements. Like, for example, here is a measurement uh, shown for this white dwarf GD362, for which I have previously shown you a spectrum. Uh, you can measure lines of uh, many different elements uh, there. You know, there's scanium, titanium, vanadium, and so on. 
Uh, and then you can compare the uh, relative abundances, you know, here it's a uh, particular element relative to the silicon, uh, to, for example, uh, you know, some objects in the solar system. And what you find is that uh, the composition of, you know, the abundance pattern in this, uh, in this atmosphere of uh, white dwarfs is actually not too far from, like, you know, terrestrial compositional pattern or lunar compositional pattern uh, and so on and so forth. So now people are actually, you know, stretching this uh, kind of, uh, you know, plots to a certain limit, in my opinion. They say, well, this asteroid that fell into this white dwarf must be produced at such and such distance because it doesn't, we don't see a lot of uh, oxygen, so there must be not too much water, so it must have formed the inside of the ice line, or it must be a dry asteroid, or something like this. And, you know, sometimes it's really interesting when we say whether it was made of olivines or something else. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's like, basically doing an autopsy on this asteroid by just, you know, measuring the abundance in the atmosphere of uh, white dwarfs. But, but at least, you know, this abundance pattern is not contradict the idea that this uh, can be, uh, you know, solid refractory body with large size, which got kind of destroyed uh, in the vicinity of uh, white dwarf. Okay, then, uh, then the next question that arises is, you know, okay, well, uh, then how do you get the white dwarf? How, how do you get an asteroid to pass so close to the white dwarf? Because, as I you know, previously mentioned, uh, expansion of the uh, AGB uh, star uh, atmosphere will essentially wipe out all the minor bodies uh, from like one astronomical unit or so uh, in the vicinity of uh, the white dwarf. And then it needs a mechanism to actually you know, send the asteroid from a much further out, from like uh, several astronomical units at least, uh, onto this uh, very low perihelion, per per periastron uh, orbit. So it, it cannot do it uh, on its own in uh, just a regular Keplerian dynamics. There must be some strong perturbation that would uh, do this uh, to this particular asteroid. And uh, in 2002, Davis and uh, Sigerson uh, have came up with, with, with the following idea. They uh, suppose they suggested uh, that before uh, before this that on a main sequence, the progenitor of the White Dwarf uh, had its own planetary system, with, you know, Jupiter's, uh, you know, maybe terrestrial planets, his belts of asteroids, sky belts, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this system, you know, was uh, kind of brought itself into a stable uh, state on a new and near time scale uh, that these uh, uh, stars have, uh, have spent on the, on the main sequence. So it was a stable, you know, nice uh, planetary system. The stability of planetary systems is usually decided by, uh, judged upon the following parameter, which is the ratio of the hue radio, radius of the two interacting uh, planets to the radial separation between them. If this number is uh, small, that is, if the planets are well separated uh, uh, in space uh, from each other in units of their hue radii, then the system is going to be stable. And in the solar system, you know, the delta E over RH is a, a significantly large number, then the solar system is stable on billion year time scales. So, but when this number is uh, low, that is, when the Roche radius is high, then the system gets uh, destabilized. Now, let's see what happens with this number, with this uh, stability parameter, as uh, the white dwarf uh, loses mass. So this number can be written in the following way. By definition, delta A is just A2 minus A1. Here I'm assuming that there are just two big planets in the system. And I'm looking at the stability of this two planetary uh, system. So A2 minus A1, and the Roche radius is defined here as, you know, uh, you know basically the middle, uh, mid midpoint between their center major axis and the mass uh, ratio of uh, the planets to the center. Star. This is how we define uh, the Roche radius. Uh, when uh, white dwarf expands, uh, you know, uh, some major axes uh, change, but they change in accord with each other, so that uh, changes uh, here and here cancel each other, and nothing happens uh, to this ratio. But the mass, uh, masses of the planets also stay the same. But the mass of the white of the central object uh, uh, changes; it becomes lower, which means uh, that the final uh, final uh, value of this ratio is equal to the initial value of this ratio times uh, the you know, initial mass of the central object divided by the final mass of the central object to the power of one third. So this, it means that as soon as the central object is losing mass, you are going to, uh, increase, you are going to increase uh, this uh, stability parameter, and that basically means that you're going to destabilize uh, the planetary system that existed around this uh, star. Destabilization means uh, that you'll get essentially dynamical chaos on pretty short time scales, you will perturb any uh, belts of minor bodies that might have existed in your system. And this is a good way of actually, you know, scattering uh, uh, some of these objects, you know, out of the system, and some of the objects will be scattered uh, towards uh, the central star. 
and uh, they will necessarily pass you know, close enough to be, uh, you know, there will be some object that will pass close enough to be entirely destroyed and to be able to form uh, this uh, release. So in, in, this, in this scenario, you definitely you essentially predict the presence of massive uh, uh, objects like you know, Jupiter-like planets or something like that uh, in the vicinity of uh, this white world. So as long as you see this near infrared access, or as long as you see uh, metal enrichment, significant metal enrichment, uh, you can be kind of expecting the presence of a Jupiter mass planet uh, in the outskirts uh, of uh, this you know, former uh, planetary system. Uh, and we may actually have some evidence for the existence of uh, uh, such uh, planets. So, uh, Fergo Mulali, uh, for example, uh, has done some work on doing essentially, you know, something akin to pulsar timing in one of the uh, in one of the white dwarfs. So, in this case, instead of uh, you know rotational pulsations of uh, uh, pulsar, uh, he used the internal oscillations of uh, the white dwarf to do kind of uh, you know the timing uh, uh, orientation, uh, the timing of the orbit of uh, this white dwarf. And you found that there are some, you know, timing variations which can be fit uh, by, you know, sinusoidal perturbation uh, between the 2.4 Jupiter mass planet and the 2.7 uh, AU uh, orbit. But you know, this is still pretty much in the, in the air. So, um, you know, this is not a very hard evidence in favor. This is not a discovery of uh, of a planet around the white dwarf yet. Okay, good. So now, uh, now that we uh, have sort of that I hope I provided some motivation for uh, you know, why is it interesting to study these uh, new disks around my world simply because they can tell us something uh, about uh, planet formation uh, and the existence of the planetary systems around the intermediate uh, nice stars. Uh, now let's uh, go back to this compact debris disks and try to see whether we understand the physics of these uh, objects uh, well enough. So in particular, can we understand uh, how uh, does it, you know, how, how do these disks look like, you know, what are their, you know, constraints on their properties, and how do we uh, drive uh, this accretion that we see, uh, you know, as that <coughs> the, uh, evidence for in the atmospheres of these uh, white worlds. Okay, so here, what I'm showing here is a schematic picture of uh, uh, of a solid uh, debris disk in the vicinity of the white dwarf. This is a view kind of, well, I just did a cut uh, through the disk, so what we are seeing is a uh, kind of meridional view of the disk. So there is a, a dusty disk that extends over some distance, uh, uh, over some distance, it has an outer radius comparable to the uh, Roche radius, but it necessarily the dust disk has to have an inner radius which is dictated simply by the sublimation of this uh, solid material. We know that all the, all the dust grains, you know, all, all the meteorites or anything else would simply sublimate the temperatures in excess of, let's say, 1500 Kelvin, simply because it's too hot for the material to be in a solid phase. It's going uh, to sublimate and it's going to produce a gas phase. Uh, at the same time, temperatures at the surface of the white dwarf uh, uh, are typically reaching you know, at least 10,000 uh, Kelvin. So that means that at some separation from the surface of the white dwarf, temperature is going to be high enough for, for any solid material to sublimate. And if you calculate uh, the radius at which this happens, uh, this radius is given by this uh, simple formula. Basically, you get this formula by just, uh, uh, I mean, if this were not uh, Ts, sublimation temperature, uh, then this formula just uh, says that you know this is a radius at which temperature is equal to some uh, particular value. This is a very simple formula that you, know, you can derive essentially in the back uh, of the, at the back of the envelope. Uh, and if you plug in the actual numbers, uh, you find that this radius is typically uh, on the order of uh, 20 uh, radii of the white dwarf. Uh, for a uh, you know white dwarf, with a temperature of about 10,000 Kelvin, and for the sublimation temperature of about uh, 1,500 Kelvin. What this means is that there is an inner cavity in uh, the debris disk and uh, the material can no longer propagate through this debris disk towards uh, the white dwarf in a solid phase. It has to form uh, the gas phase first and then of course you know uh, metals which are uh, producing the gas phase at the sublimation radius, they can actually be accreted uh, towards uh, the central star uh, in the usual kind of fashion as it happens in any, uh, any accretion. The accretion time scale of this uh, separation is a separation of, of, of you know, like 10 or 20, uh, 10 or 20 uh, bar white dwarf radii is actually quite short. It's uh, at the level of uh, 100 years or so. So as long as you put material over here, you know, it uh, very quickly ends up on the surface of the white dwarf. So then the problem is uh, then how, how do you provide the necessary mass accretion rate uh, through this solid disk? 
right? So, you know, simply by kind of ambiguity, the amount of gas that gets accreted on the white work is equal to the amount of uh, uh, kind of dust that gets driven towards the white work in, uh, uh, in the solar phase. Uh, so, and it's, uh, it turns out that this is, this is not easy to do. It's not easy to transport material at the necessary rate uh, through these uh, disks uh, of, of solids. Uh, because, you know, if you think about it, what can drive the accretion through the solid disk? Uh, in the case of uh, Saturn ring, we know that uh, collisions between uh, particles uh, in, driven by the, by the shear in the disk, by the differential rotation in the disk, cause, uh, you know, kind of effective uh, friction. And this effect of friction drives uh, some uh, amount of spreading in the of rings. But this spreading is extremely slow. So that rings, uh, if they evolve, they evolve on you know, billion-year time scales. And the mass accretion rate driven by just this uh, quasi-viscous evolution in certain rings is extremely small. It would never be competitive with these numbers you know, at the level of 10 to the 8, 10 to the 10 grams per second that people are finding uh, in observations of uh, metal rich white dwarfs. So it actually has to be something else that is driving accretion on the surfaces of uh, this metal rich white dwarfs. So uh, in the beginning of this year, uh, I looked at uh, a different mechanism that can drive accretion onto the surface of white dwarf. And this mechanism basically uh, is, is basically related to the radiative effects of the white dwarf. So it is true that white dwarfs uh, usually have a pretty low luminosity of these ages that we are talking about, uh, ages of about half a million year. Uh, luminosities are typically at the level of 10 to the minus uh, 3 solar luminosity. On the other hand, the material uh, that uh, is in this debris is, sits pretty close to the white dwarf surface at a separation of about only one uh, solar radius. So uh, then the radiative fluxes that this material receives uh, are actually quite high, and uh, this radiative flux can actually do something uh, to the dynamics of this uh, material, of this uh, solid ring, uh, that ring of solids that uh, is orbiting uh, the white dwarf. Now, as I mentioned previously, this ring of solids is very geometrically thin. Here I kind of exaggerated the uh, thickness uh, of this uh, disk of solids. In fact, it can be you know, as thin as the rings of Saturn, and you know that rings of Saturn have a thickness of about 10 meters or so. Uh, so in this case, you know, if that is uh, the case, then the radius of the white dwarf, which is you know, about the size of the Earth, actually is going to be much larger uh, than the thickness of the ring. And then white dwarf is going to essentially illuminate the surface of uh, uh, this ring you know, from above and from uh, below. So you can represent the uh, emission of a white dwarf effectively as you know, like two lamp posts, one here and one here, kind of to mimic uh, the finite uh, size of the white dwarf. And that then gives you the typical, uh, uh, typical angle, incidence angle at which radiation is hitting the uh, surface of uh, the white dwarf. And this angle, of course, is just the radius of the star divided by the uh, distance in a radial direction. And, uh, then you also, and then you also kind of assume uh, that if the uh, disk is optically thick in a vertical direction, then it definitely is going to be optically thick to this uh, uh, radiation coming at a grazing incidence angle, so that all of this radiation is going to be absorbed by the disk. What this absorption of radiation does is that it actually drives uh, the evolution of the disk. And this evolution of the disk proceeds via an effect which is called the pointing robertson uh, drag. Uh, so I don't know how many of you know about what this effect is, but this is a very elegant uh, effect which owes its existence to the uh, special relativity. Suppose, uh, and it's actually quite well known in planetary sciences because they think this is what's uh, causing the evolution of micro-sized particles, for example, in the solar system and in debris disks uh, around other stars. Uh, let's take a look at a particle that moves on a, a purely circular orbit uh, around uh, the sun uh, at a big flare and uh, velocity. In the frame of reference of the particle, uh, because of the uh, aberration of light, uh, the purely radial, uh, purely radial phone flux produced by the sun gets converted into, gets some kind of inclination angle, which is essentially V to glare divided by the C. This is just the usual aberration point. And so uh, what happens is that the radiation uh, received by this particle gets some component in the azimuthal uh, direction. This radiation, of course, brings with it some amount of momentum which is just the power absorbed by the particle divided by C. So the total force, as you can force, that, start, that acts on the particle is essentially the power divided by C times V times this uh, angle, V divided by C. So it's a very simple formula, power times the velocity divided by the speed of light uh, squared. 
And this force actually causes in the solar system, you know, uh, with the motion of dust particles, micron sized dust particles around the sun, it causes a drift of micron sized particles uh, uh, on a, about a million year time scale uh, at the one astronomical unit. So this drift can actually be quite effective and it can be quite efficient at removing the small dust particles uh, uh, from around the uh, normal stars. So uh, now I'm talking about this, I, I can talk about the ring of these uh, solid particles as if uh, these rings were like uh, solid plates. Uh, and in this case, you know, I can calculate the surface uh, acting on the surface, the force acting on the surface of this uh, plate uh, per unit uh, uh, surface area essentially. So of course this certain, this this uh, force will be just uh, again this you know angular factor multiplied over c. Then the power uh, intercepted by the element of uh, this surface, which is uh, L star, luminosity of star divided by the four pi r squared, and divided by c, the third energy in the momentum, times uh, alpha, which is uh, you know how much the amount of uh, uh, the amount of momentum gets diluted by uh, this basic uh, instance. So this is a force that acts on a one square centimeter of the surface of this uh, ring. Then I can say that uh, this force produces torque, which is R cross F uh, pointing Robertson. Uh, and this uh, torque causes the evolution of the angular momentum of the same, uh, uh, of the same uh, you know, square centimeter of the disk, which would be you know, sigma times d by t of the specific angular momentum of this, uh, of this uh, ring, of this uh, ring element. And that gives me the radial velocity then. I mean, if I differentiate this expression, I get that the radial velocity is given by this simple formula. If I plug in the force, uh, pointing Robertson force uh, per unit the surface area into this formula, I finally uh, get uh, that the total mass accretion rate with the pointing Robertson effect is given by this you know, 2 pi r e r times sigma. It's given by an extremely simple formula, which is just the incidence angle of the radiation times the luminosity of the center of object divided by c squared. This is exact formula. It doesn't make any assumptions. It doesn't depend on the properties of particles. It doesn't depend on the surface density in these. It doesn't depend on you know, what uh, these particles are made of. So it's, you know, it's an extremely uh, simple and uh, very transparent result. <coughs> Actually, it tells you that uh, the maximum limit on the mass accretion rate that you can get from the pointing robertson effect. Because if alpha is equal to 1, if you are able to intercept all the uh, you know, luminosity of the central object, this would be the amount of the mass accretion rate that you can get uh, you know, due to the body Robinson effect. And for this white box, it would be a number at the level of 10 to the 9 grams per, uh, grams per second. But of course, these disks are you know, uh, you know, extending, uh, these disks are pretty far from the surface of the white box. And so this alpha, which is approximately the radius of the white box divided by uh, the distance, is uh, at the level of you know like 0.1 or 0.05 or something like that, and that lowers uh, the pointing Robertson, uh, the, the, the mass accretion rate into the pointing Robertson effect. So then the natural step to do is okay to say okay what would be this uh, mass accretion rate at the, let's say the inner radius of uh, this uh, dusty of this uh, disk of solids, and the inner radius is given by this uh, sublimation radius. Now this is a formula that I had before. If I just take it, plug it into this expression, where now I introduce uh, phi r, you know, this is a more careful calculation, which takes into account the possibility that the radio, uh, radio uh, optical depth is not equal to unity, and so on and so forth. But this doesn't change uh, the calculation uh, too much. So if I take this formula, put it in here, I get uh, the final expression for the uh, pointing robertson mass accretion rate at the inner uh, uh, edge uh, of the disk. And what you see is that it scales uh, quadratically with both uh, the radius of the white dwarf, temperature of the white dwarf, and the sublimation temperature of uh, uh, the material that uh, is spread that uh, comprises uh, uh, these uh, rings. So this is a, you know this is a pretty uh, strong prediction, and this is something that one may be able to test. So I thought about this, and uh, I decided to check whether this uh, kind of idea holds. So I took uh, the data, available data on the mass accretion rates of uh, different white dwarfs, uh, combined with the temperatures of the parent stars, and I just assumed that you know I fixed the, the radius of the white dwarf, I fixed the sublimation temperature of the dust, and then I have a nice prediction between the uh, mass accretion rate and the temperature of the star. Okay. So what is shown here are uh, the red the red dots show uh, systems uh, in which the radio release 
and uh, black crosses show systems in which uh, there are no decreases. And blue curves show, uh, you know, this relation that I just uh, uh, basically displayed uh, uh, for you previously for different values of the sublimation temperature, different values of the radius of the white dwarf, uh, and so on and so forth. If I take some sort of a vanilla case, which is a one uh, a solar radius white dwarf and a dust that which sublimates at the temperature of 1300 Kelvin, uh, what I find is that this is a blue solid line. And the observation you should make is that all of the white dwarfs uh, which have degree discs around them uh, have mass accretion rates above this line. And this is exactly what you expect. Because if there is a disk around the white dwarf, the minimum amount of mass accretion that you can, that you can get in this system is going to be dictated by the pointing Robertson drag. You cannot hide pointing Robertson drag. It's going to be always uh, present in the system and it's going to provide you some minimum amount of uh, accretion towards a uh, central object. At the same time, you, might, you, may, you may know that there is, uh, you know, not, I mean, if pointing Robertson drag was the only thing uh, uh, acting on this degree list, uh, then you would expect that uh, all these objects would have uh, uh, m, m, m dot given by m dot the point Robertson. And this clearly is not the case. Uh, many objects with degree disks actually have uh, mass accretion rates much higher by, you know, like two or even uh, three orders of magnitude. And this, of course, uh, demands uh, some explanation. Uh, many, many white dwarfs have uh, lower mass accretion rates, but uh, these guys you can explain uh, by saying, well, maybe they have a optically thin uh, disks around them, which we haven't detected, and from these disks you can uh, readily show that you can get lower uh, mass uh, accretion rates. Or maybe these disks have been you know, just exhausted, and what you see are the remnants of, uh, of uh, accretion. But you need to be able to explain these high uh, M dot uh, systems uh, as well. And uh, in the remaining five minutes, let let me just show you how you can uh, try to uh, do this. So let me show uh, show again this picture, which I you know cartoon picture which I presented before. Uh, this is a picture of a uh, solid uh, disk that you know extends uh, from the Roche radius to the sublimation radius. This is where you produce all the evaporation. This is where you produce the gas phase, which accretes onto the central object. But accretion disks, when you bring mass in, in, in any accretion disk, when you bring mass onto the central object, some amount of mass has to go out to carry. It's angle, to carry angular momentum uh, with it. That means that, not all, that you will have not only the inner uh, kind of disk uh, in this uh, cavity, but also the outer disk extending out from the sublimation point. Uh, and this outer disk actually may explain the coexistence of these uh, you know, gaseous and dusty disks that we see in some, uh, in some of the systems. But then, you know, once you have gaseous disk on top of the dusty disk, uh, you, need to, you, you can guess that there may be some interaction between them. And you need to understand how this interaction proceeds. Uh, uh, I should I should say that you know in this case dust dust the disk you know, it's made of uh, microscopic particles uh, still is going to be you know very geometrically thin, but the disk of uh, gas is going to be of course very extended because you know thermal pressure will uh, provide some vertical support and this height of this disk will be much much larger than the thickness of the disk of uh, uh, solids. So here is a, a, probably the final slide that I have. Uh, it essentially outlines the simple picture of the coupled evolution between uh, of the coupled evolution of solid and gaseous disks uh, in this uh, in this uh, around this uh, white worms. So imagine that dust uh, dust evaporates at the sublimation radius and it creates a uh, gas uh, there, as you know I showed right here. Then some of this gas will spread out and uh, will uh, spatially coexist uh, with the dust disk. Now, those of you who have uh, worked on uh, planet formation know uh, that in protoplanetary disk uh, theory there is this problem uh, called one meter problem. And this problem is basically uh, related to the fact that uh, gaseous uh, disks rotate at an angular velocity which is lower than the Keplerian velocity of, uh, let's say, a solid body moving at the same, at the same uh, seven major separation. This is simply because a gaseous disk has some additional pressure support, so the gas spins uh, slower uh, than uh, solid particles. In the conditions of the protoplanetary disks, so this uh, differential uh, rotation amounts to approximately 30 meters per second at the separation of one astronomical unit. And whenever uh, you have an approximately one meter sized boulder in a nebula, uh, this headwind that this boulder sees is going to cause its very rapid migration towards a central star and will cause this boulder basically you know, to disappear on a time scale of about 100 years. 
The same thing will be happening over here because, uh, well, similar thing will be happening over here because now you have uh, this disk of gas spinning at a slower rate than the disk of solids. Then again, there is a differential friction between them, and this differential friction exerts uh, as a useful force in the direction opposite to the rotation of uh, the dust and disk. So essentially, gas, which is produced by this sublimation of dust, is slowing down the dust itself, you know, slowing down these uh, solid particles and causing uh, their uh, radial migration towards, uh, towards the white core. Of course, if you enhance the radial migration by putting in more gas, that means that you'll get more sublimation over here, even more gas uh, in this part of the, of the disk, and even more, uh, you know, and dot uh, to the solid disk. So essentially, you have a positive uh, feedback in the system, and a system under certain conditions can simply run away. The condition for runaway is that uh, the viscosity, uh, the viscosity, viscous time scale, uh, is uh, uh, long enough so that it cannot uh, rapidly eliminate uh, the gas that you are putting in at the sublimation radius. Because you, at the sublimation radius, uh, you know, the sublimation essentially adds matter in the gas phase at the rate which is given by this uh, time scale, T replenishment, which is, you know, local surface density divided by the sigma dot, which is given the sublimation. And if the viscous time scale is long enough, that is, if it's longer than this time uh, to replenish the gas, then it cannot, uh, you know, move out the gas from this region. Gas density builds up, and you get stronger and stronger coupling between the gaseous disk and disk of uh, solids. So then uh, you can actually get some very high uh, end dots uh, in, in such a system. So recently I've been doing some calculations with uh, Brian Benzger, a postdoc uh, at uh, Princeton, of uh, precisely this uh, scenario. And this is a plot that shows the results of uh, our calculation. Basically, m dot divided by the m dot point in Robertson as a function of time. We found that when the viscous time is very is uh, quite short, you know, compared to this replenishment time scale, sort of on the order of uh, one half, uh, then you find that uh, you know you never build up enough uh, gas density uh, in your system. Uh, to cause any, uh, you know, to cause strong coupling between the gaseous and the dust and yeast. And all that uh, happens to the dust and yeast is basically just evolves under this Pony Robertson effect at a uh, pretty much constant uh, uh, value of uh, m dot. But as the viscosity becomes less and less efficient as you increase uh, the viscous uh, time scale, you find that, you know, when the time viscous time scale becomes comparable to the replenishment time scale, you know, the system does indeed run away. And you can get uh, an increase in mass accretion rate during some moments of time at the level of, you know, uh, by a factor of, uh, uh, you know, 100 or uh, even a thousand. So such coupled evolution in principle of uh, mass in nature's disk uh, can in principle uh, explain this, you know, extremely high mass accretion rates which are seen uh, in observations. And this scenario, this runaway scenario presents a pretty good, uh, you know, kind of candidate uh, scenario for explaining uh, uh, the variety of uh, M dots uh, that we see uh, in metal polluted uh, white words. So what determines T nu is? Uh, Sorry? What determines T nu is not T nu is determined basically by, you know, the radius of your region, like uh, the radius of the inner cavity, sublimation radius, and uh, viscosity, alpha, alpha parameter. So if you take alpha parameter to be 0.1, then T nu is 100 years. Uh, alpha parameter means gas and point. Yeah, and gas and point, of course. Okay, so that's uh, pretty much it. I just wanted to, you know, summarize uh, what I uh, told you, I guess, in the beginning of the talk uh, and uh, in, in its uh, second part as well, some theoretical ideas, uh, that metal-rich white words can be the puzzle for uh, theorists and observers for, you know, essentially several decades uh, because interstellar medium accretion cannot explain their existence. But there is this recent idea that the circumstellar accretion from the material that uh, originally existed in the vicinity of white dwarf can actually do the job and explain, uh, you know, this uh, uh, large, uh, large metal accretion rates seen in many systems. And we have pretty good uh, confirmation of uh, this picture from the detections uh, of this uh, degree disks around white dwarfs. Uh, and also, that, you know, recently have gotten some, hopefully, some uh, more, uh, some better understanding of the properties of these uh, degree disks around these systems. Thank you. Well, um, if you have the common, you have the excess of voltage, right? And that would improve the process. That would uh, improve the process. You wouldn't have to rely just on the vaporous, vaporized uh, component. Or is this what you actually did specifically for French? Uh, I mean, so I bring in a comment, yeah. and then you 
now it highly disrupts. Mm -hmm. But then you would produce obligation of this. You wouldn't produce vestiges, right? Well, we still have some things. But they'd be down yeah. in mass as you have more friction. Right. <coughs> that, 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 would, that would help. So in this case, you would have some uh, gas, like, you know, for example, H2O gas from the very beginning. Exactly. Uh, but then you would have hydrogen at this gas phase. Yes. Okay. So when people do these observations of emission lines, what they see are emission lines of calcium, magnesium, iron. They never see any evidence. Never see any. No hydrogen. No hydrogen. No, no. No, no. I mean, there are no more. This is a hot gas. This is gas at temperature of several thousand uh, Kelvin. Like, you know, well, but you go a little bit, you can expect to have some hydrogen. I mean, it's some water. No, no, I mean, it's it's, it's it can get pretty high. Sorry? Water can get pretty high. Well, not. Well, the models for the thermal states of these gases is actually pretty temperatures, you know, like 4 to 6,000 Kelvin. And that's the most part. Hmm? Well, you're just extending the fairway as a radius. Well, it's, it's, yeah, just a factor of several. Yeah, 3, 5, maybe. So if pointing Robertson were the only effect, then it's a strong function of radius. So what would be the evolution? Would sort of be out of cavity? OK, OK, OK. I can show you what the evolution would be. I'm, I'm prepared for that. So let's, uh, the evolution will actually be quite uh, interesting. So this is a work that I have uh, done recently with a student, Konstantin uh, Bishkarov, from Moscow. Right? He's actually a uh, uh, Princeton, as a grad student. So uh, this uh, diagram shows the evolution of initial surface density distribution in some sort of uh, well, specific units. Basically, x is a radius normalized by the inner radius of uh, by the sublimation radius. Okay, and on the vertical axis you have uh, the optical depth, which is uh, which is uh, uh, basic optical depth in a uh, you know, grazing instrument. So it's not vertical optical depth, which is much lower, but actually they're kind of almost the radial optical depth. It, which is used here as a proxy for, for the surface density, essentially. So surface density is just proportional to this uh, tau variable. And we started a calculation with, uh, you know, what, what happens to this disk under the action of putting Robertson drag along by uh, taking a Gaussian, uh, just kind of Gaussian ring and a separation of five uh, sublimation radii and seeing uh, what happens. So what happens is that, uh, first of all, there is an interesting feature that, you know, you very quickly develop the sharp outer edge uh, on the, you know, in this distribution of dust. And it uh, maintains itself, so it just you know, moves out of this uh, sharp outer edge. So this is like a prediction for observations, actually, that there should be a sharp outer color in the dust uh, uh, density. But then you also very quickly de develop this optically thin uh, tail of dust extending uh, to the sublimation radius. So that sharp outer edge is because the force being in area is constant, but the surface density has gone down, so you get a rapid evolution. Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. Because, uh, because uh, essentially, you know, the, VR, uh, effective radial velocity of the material, is inversely proportional to the surface density. So here it's low, here it's high, and essentially all this material ends up kind of slamming into the disk and accumulating there and uh, so driving its evolution. Uh, and so essentially, you know, this evolution proceeds like that. I mean, these are some you know, cold units, let's say. Uh, but basically, you know, on some uh, time scale, you get, uh, you wipe out all the, all the uh, mass uh, for such a disk into the body products of the 